Hello, check, check, hello, check, hello, check, check. One, two, three, check, hello, check. Hello, check, check, hello, check, check, check. Hello, check, check, hello, check, check. Tashi the Lake and good morning to all. Welcome back to the second day of Geneva Forum 2021, Economic, Social and Cultural Rights Violation by China. So we will begin the second day, the last day of the Geneva Forum 2020, 2021 with a very special session on Tibet Brief 2020. May I request our speaker, Dr. Michael Van Walt Van Prague, and moderator, Ms. Kandit Somo from Tibet Bureau, Geneva.
Good morning. So I'm delighted. I'm delighted to moderate the first session of the second day of the 2021 Geneva Forum, an interactive session uh, with the lead author of the book, Tibet Brief 2020, Dr. Michael Van Wald Van Prague. Dr. Michael has served as the legal advisor to the office of His Holiness the Dalai Lama for more than two decades. That's from 1985 to 2001. Dr. Michael is the executive president of Krita and senior fellow of Sumdak Center for Advanced Legal Studies. Now, the book, Tibet Brief 2020, has been described as, if Tibet is water under the bridge, think again. So let's begin to think again with the lead author of the book, Tibet Brief 2020. So we will have the session for around 50 minutes now. And we will have the first uh, 20 to 30 minutes, maybe 25 minutes, to hear from Dr. Michael, and then open the floor for around at least 20 minutes to have questions and comments from the floor. OK, so Dr. Michael, your latest book on Tibet, uh, Tibet Brief 2020, has been widely discussed. And also, it has been now described as the best guide to understand Tibet, China, and the complexities of the world. So when we look at the book, the title is very telling. So could you just tell us what the book is all about, and what this 2020 refers to, and what you and Mike Bolgens, uh, what makes you to bring this book to bed? Brave 2020. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, for bringing uh, for making it possible to discuss this book. I, I, I really appreciate it because it's the uh, it's the result of a decade of work with around 100 scholars around the world in different universities and so on. So a lot of effort was put into it by many people, um, and I think it is an important work in particular because, because of that and because it does reflect a, a, a good and to some extent new understanding. Um, to start with the, with the last part of your question, uh, what got us to why we started this project? Um, Mick Boltius and I work for, uh, we had an organization called CREDA which is a conflict resolution organization. And so our main work is mediation in interstate conflicts around the world. Mediation, facilitation of peace processes, advice on negotiations, etc. Um, clearly, when it comes to China and Tibet, uh, we're not in a position to mediate. Firstly, because China is not interested in any third party mediation. But also, I think if, even if they were, they would probably not come to me for mediation. So that's not what we did in this particular case. In this particular case, we did another activity which we also often do in CREDA, which is to try to identify the obstacles, the principal obstacles to achieving a negotiated solution. Um, and in the case of Tibet, that led us to, or in the case of the Tibet-China conflict, that led us to uh, look very deeply into the history. And the reason we did this is because China has placed history um, right in the center of the conflict. Firstly, because the PRC's only claim to legitimacy to rule Tibet is that Tibet has always been a part of China or since antiquity. So, as you will have noticed, the PRC has never claimed any other grounds for ruling Tibet, only the historical ground. And that makes history essential to understand. 
Secondly, also, and this is tied to it, because the, uh, the, the government of the PRC um, has or requires that His Holiness the Dalai Lama make a statement that Tibet's always been a part of China um, as a prerequisite to substantive negotiations, to substantive discussions. So for both these reasons, clearly history is, is key. Um, and so the, we, we approached the project in two parts. The first part was uh, working with scholars around the world to try to understand um, inner and East Asian history from the time of Genghis Khan to the present time. And we chose Genghis Khan because that is a moment that Eurasia changed. And much of what we see today in, in the Eurasian continent is the result of the creation of the Mongolian Empire by Genghis Khan and his successors. But also because that is the point at which, according to the PRC, Tibet became a part of China. Um, and so it becomes important, at least from then, to, to follow and understand history. So that first project led to this book, which is Sacred Mandates, uh, Asian International Relations Since Genghis Khan. And this has contribution from some of the top scholars in the world in, in the book itself. Um, the, what we did with this was, you know, in Europe in particular, but in the West in general, we are accustomed to understanding or to learning about Asian history, in particular East and Inner Asia. And I use the word Inner Asia. Some people use the word Central Asia. Some people use the word High Asia, Haute Asie. Um, I mean the area of Mongolia, Manchuria, Tibet, uh, uh, East Turkestan. Uh, it can extend further into Afghanistan and so on. There, there's not really a very clear definition of what, what the borders are. But in other words, that central Eurasian area. That and East Asia is what we studied. Um, uh, and we are used to, as I say, in Europe and in the West, to understand the, the history of that part of the world primarily from the Chinese, or if you like, from the cynic Confucian philosophical perspective and political perspective. And that is because one of the most important disciplines in the past, in academia and elsewhere, to study Asia was Sinology. And so we have been relying on Chinese source materials to understand the rest of relations in that part of the world for, for a very long time. That is not true of how the Japanese have studied that part of the world. It's not true of how the Mongolians have done it, how the Russians have done it, how many others have understood Asia. And it is only fairly recently that uh, new perspectives have been brought into um, historical study of this part of the world because we've had access to, for example, uh, the archives of Mongolia and the Mongolian documents that during the period of the Soviet Union were not easily accessible. Um, we have much more access to Russian uh, archives and documentation, but also because in the West, um, there has been an increase in the number of scholars that, have, that, that study and understand the Manchu language, which for a uh, long time before that, there were very few people that did, and there are lots of Manchu documents. Uh, also, the access to those documents was not so easy, and that has become also more accessible. So for all these, and this is, not, this is true, and I emphasize that, of the West and of Europe. Japanese scholars have for couple of hundred years studied these documents. And so if you look at Japanese scholarship, there's a completely different understanding of China, of Inner Asia, of the relation between the two, or the lack of relationship between the two. Uh, but Japanese scholarship is hardly ever translated into English, French, German, etc. They translate those languages into Japanese, but the other way around is very rare. And so one really needs to go to Japan and discuss it with the scholars to understand their knowledge of, of Asia. 
This just to give you an idea of the, the approach that we had was to look at Tibetan, Mongolian, Russian, Persian, Japanese, Vietnamese, uh, Chinese, Manchu scholarship to understand and, and uh, source material to understand really um, how, we should, how we should relate to Inner and East Asia. And because this is a new approach that decenters China from this history, um, and to some extent centers Mongolia, because it, the Im impact and influence of the Mongols on Eurasia is so much bigger than the impact of China on Eurasia, the lasting impact. And I think this is, has been under-recognized throughout, both by Europeans and obviously by, by the Chinese. Um, so what is the consequence of this new way of looking at this history has been uh, also uh, a consequence in relation to how we place Tibet in Asia and Tibet's role in Asia. And so we felt and we feel that uh, 70 years after uh, China invaded Tibet, and in particular in the last 20 years, um, there is no longer clarity on um, what happened in relation to Tibet. There's no longer clarity on whether Tibet was really a part of China or not, whether the Manchu Empire was Chinese, the, in other words, the Qing, whether um, Tibet was really um, invaded, uh, whether it was aggression, whether Tibet became a part of China um, uh, after the invasion in 1951. And so it is because of this lack of clarity, which has been uh, fed by very effective, single-pointed Chinese propaganda on a historical narrative that has really caught on internationally because the propaganda has been so effective and not effectively countered, that there is a, a kind of cloud over Tibet. We don't quite know anymore whether it's true or not and what, how, we should, how we should relate to China's rule of Tibet. And I find this even in, uh, in foreign ministries when you talk to foreign ministry officials that are specialized in China, uh, that there isn't quite certainty anymore. 30 years ago, that wasn't the case. It was very clear that Tibet had been invaded, that Tibet was, was a country that had been aggressed, uh, and there were certain consequences that followed from that. That is no longer the case. And that is why we, we embarked upon this project, um, and that is what the title really reflects. So the title, I realize, doesn't really translate very well in other languages, and so we're going to have to rethink the title in terms of any uh, editions in French and Chinese and Tibetan and other languages. Tibet Brief 2020 simply means, uh, in French it would be Tibet au clair. It means bring clarity to the Tibetan question, to, the, to, to what this is about. Um, because 2020 refers to 2020 vision, which is perfect vision, clear vision. And this is why you have this little thing here, is when you go to the eye doctor, this is what you get to see. And if you can read the bottom, then you have clear vision and you understand Tibet and you understand the situation. That's what it was meant, but I understand that you really, I need to explain it for people to get it. So it's not, it's not, it's not entirely effective. Um, Anyway, so that's what, that's what the title uh, is all about. And I hope that the book actually achieves that objective. So thank you, Dr. Michael, uh, for explaining what the book is all about. And also now that it seems the book has unpacked many issues surrounding Tibet. And also the book has powerfully exposed uh, Chinese self-serving narrative on Tibet. So could you believe, uh, so in, in your journey to research and work on the book, could you briefly tell us what are your findings on Beijing's push for its narrative on Tibet? Um, 
Yes, so, so, so the, obviously what's important to know is that the, the principal finding of this, of this project, of this book, uh, of the second one, is that, when, uh, is that Tibet was, in fact, at no point in history was Tibet a part of China. And I think this is really very important. Um, now, it doesn't mean, and I can say that with great confidence, um, it doesn't mean that Tibet did not have relations with the Mongols, that Tibet didn't have relations with the Manchus. Um, they certainly did. Uh, even relations that included forms of um, mutual dependency or mutual, um, yeah, mutual dependency, I would say. Uh, in fact, part of the, the way in which the Tibetan uh, state was, or the, the Tibetan state was ruled and the Tibetan Buddhist world functioned was one of interdependence, was one in which the, the uh, for example, to take a good example, the Dalai Lama as ruler of Tibet, but also as spiritual head of Tibet, as a combination of both, uh, depended on uh, Mongol Khans for the defense of his realm, for the defense of the faith, for the defense of the people and of the state. And later, the same arrangement with the Manchus. So that's an interdependence. Interdependence because the Khan on his side and the Manchu Khan, or uh, as we call him, Manchu Emperor, um, was dependent on legitimization by the Dalai Lama and other senior Tibetan Lamas <clears throat> as universal ruler, as uh, Chakravarti. So that Buddhist legitimation uh, came from Tibet, and in exchange, there was a protection that came from the Mongol Khans and the Manchu Khan. Um, so yes, there was a relationship, there was a close relationship, but the key thing when you study the history carefully is to understand that this never had as a result that Tibet, that this relationship was never between Tibet and China. In other words, it was not a relationship between a Chinese state and Tibet. Um, and there is a clear distinction between the Mongol Empire and China, which China obfuscates on purpose. The same with a clear distinction between the Manchu Empire, which was also an inner Asian empire, and China, which was occupied by the Manchu Empire and made part of the Manchu Empire. And the entire regime of the Manchus was an occupation regime in China with garrisons everywhere to keep the Chinese as a subject people. The relationship between the Manchus and the Tibetans was entirely different. It was not a question of occupation. There was no occupation army. There was no administration. Um, and the same, of course, earlier with, with the Manchus. So when the Chinese talk about the Yuan dynasty having uh, Tibet becoming part of the, the China under the Yuan dynasty and again reaffirming this under the Qing dynasty, this is a falsification of history. This is not true. Tibet did not become a part of China under the Yuan. Um, it was a, a part of the greater Mongol Empire, but a very clearly distinct part tied directly to the great Khan, Hublai, and his successors. Not as emperor of China, which was one of his titles, in order to get legitimacy in China, he was the Huangdi, the Tianzi, the, the emperor of, of that part of the world, but as the great Khan of the Mongols and as the Buddhist universal ruler. That was the relationship with the Tibetans. And so I think it is those kinds of understandings that make us understand that Tibet was in fact never a part of China. And what that means is that, that when China invaded, when the PRC invaded Tibet in 1949, 50, and then uh, forced the Tibetans to conclude an agreement in 1951, this was an act of aggression 
plain and simple according to international law that existed since 1945 at least. And it is therefore one of the most fundamental violations of international law. I mean, one of the, one of the most important principles of international law, why it exists, is to stop this kind of aggression by one state against another. The consequence of that is that not only does that mean that Tibet today is an occupied state, because China cannot uh, obtain sovereignty over Tibet through uh, an act of, of force. In other words, you cannot acquire, under international law, you cannot acquire territory through the use of force, period. And so China did not acquire sovereignty over Tibet, which means that today, legally speaking, Tibet is not a part of China. But Tibet is an occupied state, an illegally occupied state. Um, and that is something that's also important to, to be very much aware of and to insist, because it, it has a direct relationship to the legitimacy of China's rule over Tibet. In other words, there is today no legitimacy in China's rule over Tibet, and the Chinese leaders are very conscious of this. They know that they have a legitimacy deficit in Tibet, which is why they want the Dalai Lama to make a statement that Tibet's always been a part of China, because that legitimizes their historical narrative that gives them then legitimacy. And secondly, that is why, as, you, as you've noticed, so often the Chinese pressure other governments to make statements that they recognize Tibet as part of China, because that creates also a sense of legitimacy. It doesn't create legitimacy, because France cannot give China legitimacy over Tibet. Firstly, because it's illegal for France to recognize that Tibet is part of China. International law forbids recognizing annexations through the use of force. But secondly, um, it, that legitimacy has to come from the Tibetans through a process of negotiations. And uh, as long as that has not taken place, the Chinese government does not have legitimacy in Tibet. This is why they need to negotiate with Tibetans. So maybe we will take some questions and comments from Flo, and then we will run with the time. OK, so I'll open the floor to take two questions. And then we will uh, get back with the final concluding. Okay. Anyone, questions or comments? Please identify yourself be before asking questions or giving comment. Uh -huh. My name is Rachel Frizzecki. And a um, <coughs> uh, simple question. The, the book, the history book, is this becoming effective? The work that you're doing today that you're talking about are nations listening to this? Is this getting out to people who need to hear this effectively? Um, so this just came out in December, so it's fairly new. Um, and so we have, we'll have to, to, it has to be distributed further. People have to read it, wait for reactions, etc. So it'll take some time. The first book, uh, I had expected to get the, the uh, Sacred Mandates, which is a more academic book. I had expected to get quite a strong uh, pushback from the academic community, especially Sinologists. <clears throat> but to my surprise, that's not happened. Reviews have been good. And, um, uh, and in fact, just a few weeks ago, that book got the prize as the best teaching book, as you were mentioning. Um, on, on Asian international relations from, the, uh, from a body of the um, International Institute of Asian Studies. And so that, that affirms that this is also academically a valid approach that is now um, probably going to be mainstream. And so we are seeing a shift from the, the, the cynic kind of dominant approach to Asian, to understanding Asia, to, to something much more balanced. Uh, and I'm very happy about that. So in terms of how people are reacting, I think 
what is really interesting is that this comes out at exactly the right time. You know, when you write something, you always have a deadline, and then it, you never make it. So it, it, you know, you end up, it, it's always you want to improve it, and then in the end, it always comes out much later. But actually, in this case, it's good that that happened, because now is a very unusual time where we see that governments are reassessing their relations with China in a way they've not done for decades. And um, I've just been talking to a number of people in different foreign ministries, to parliamentarians and others. The reception that this has gotten, that the main points that I've mentioned here and, that, and some others, um, uh, is unexpectedly positive. In other words, there really is an eagerness to understand what I've just said and a willingness to take it on board as part of your assessment of, re of, of China and relations with China. And that is because you know, we are realizing, I think, in, uh, in the West, the nature of the Chinese regime better than we have for some time because we were clouded by hopes of great economic benefits from uh, business with China, etc. And we were, I think, uh, under the illusion that engaging with China economically and business-wise and uh, in international organizations was going to open China up to becoming more democratic, more transparent, more free. And we've noticed that that's not been the case. In fact, it's very much the reverse. So I think that realization and the realization that China is trying to change the, the, the norms in the world um, and that is kind of bringing a clash between the democr democratic liberal world and the totalitarian world, all these things together, what's happening very visibly in East Turkestan, what's happening in Hong Kong, all this is creating a new... Um, a new understanding of what we're really dealing with with China. And that's why this timing is good, because this will be taken on board, I think. And had it come out five years ago, perhaps not. Um, and so what that also means is that we need to, those of us that would like to make change happen, need to act now. We need to use this opportunity while things are being opened up for rethinking reassessment. This is the time we need to impress upon our governments, but also civil society, um, that, that, that uh, yes, that, that uh, uh, try to impart what is really happening in Tibet and what the background of the Tibetan-Chinese conflict is. Um, you know, for, for even I think when, when there was this big conference in Dharamsala uh, um, 50 50 vision, 550 vision, most of the speak, what I, what I got out of that conference when I left, this is, I don't know, six years ago or seven years ago, I, I forget exactly when it was, but what I really walked away from was the general sense that of desperation because China was such a big country, couldn't do anything about it. There was very little new thought of initiatives of what could be done. That has changed. There is no longer this sense that China is so big we can't do anything about it. No. Now there is a shift. People are changing their attitudes. And we have to realize that even though we probably can't bring about change in China under Xi Jinping. He's not interested, I think, in anything except total control. Uh, things change and things will change. And so we need to be prepared for the moment when change will happen, as it did in the Soviet Union, as it did in, in Indonesia when East Timor took the opportunity, as it did in Indonesia when, through the tsunami when Aceh took the, comp the opportunity. So that when there is a small window of opportunity that presents itself, that everybody knows about the, about the conflict, everybody knows about the nature of China, everybody knows what they should be doing, how they should be acting to bring about change. And that's really, I think, our mission.
Thank you, Dr. Michael. Uh, Dr. Martin Mills, you um, Yes, I do. Um, I'll quickly ask the chair. I haven't read this book, and I look very much look forward to doing so. Um, will the chair allow me three small questions? Thank you. Um, OK, um, let's start with something. Um, Michael, you're from Belgium. I had a student from, Be are you, oh, so I was looking on my, your Google page, it says wrong. There we go. <laughs> You'll need to change that. And nonetheless, I have a student from Belgium. We were discussing this question not so long ago, actually. And she came up with the analogy, which I thought, I thought I'd just quickly run past you to see whether or not it makes sense. And he said, we were trying to explain the Yuan dynasty and this precise question that you raised about the Mongol Empire. And she said, so it's a little like once upon a time, Germany invaded both Belgium and France. That doesn't make Belgium part of France. Um, so I just thought I'd test that analogy with you, see what you thought of it. Um, the second question is, Peter Schweiger, in his book on the Dalai Lamas and the Chinese Empire, he actually makes a, a very strong argument about um, the uh, Chinese emperor's particular view of Tibet as maintaining peace on, the on their distant borderlands because of its specific rel religious relationships with Mongolia. And generally tended to argue that that was a stronger legitim that was a stronger sort of realpolitik than the position of a Chakravartin. So I just wonder if you'd comment on his argument there. Um, and the final one is a rather obvious one, which is, you know, you talked about negotiations and the handover. Obviously, the much maligned 17-point agreement comes up there, and I was just wondering what you did with that in your book. Thank you. That's my three. Thank you for three. I, I, the, the last one, I will, the first one I'll, I'll, will go last, if you allow me. Peter Schwieger is, is an excellent scholar. And uh, he was, in fact, one of the scholars that was involved in, in the project uh, together with, with many others. Um, and I know his book well. Um, in fact, there's a new book that's just come out that, he's, uh, that is also very interesting and excellent um, and is about Buddhism and conflict. Uh, um, so you say the Chinese emperor. I say, why do you say the Chinese emperor? What was Chinese about the emperor? I'm not pointing it out to, you know, except to say this is exactly how we have been conditioned to think about this, as it being a Chinese emperor. But again, his relationship with Tibet was not as the Chinese emperor, was as the Manchu uh, Chakravartin, the, 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 the Buddhist ruler, perhaps as the great Khan, because of exactly the reason that you say that the relationship between the Mongols and the Tibetans and the importance that the, the emperor also saw the importance between these, the relationship between the two as being vitally important. Um, so yes, I, I agree with, with Peter's analysis, uh, realpolitik analysis of the importance to the emperor of ensuring good relations with Tibet and with the Dalai Lama because that was one of the ways in which uh, possibly hostile Mongols on the borderlands could be controlled, pacified, etc. Absolutely. Um, one of the things I think that um, if you read uh, Peter's book and a number of others, there is one aspect that, um, that one notices, um, and that is, and I discussed that with him as well, is the use of terminology uh, such as sovereignty. So he and others often uh, talk about um, the Manchu Emperor as having sovereignty, as, as, as having sovereignty over Tibet or over um, um, various um, Mongol uh, Hanats, etc. Um, and that is both right and wrong. Um, it is right because sovereignty meant something completely different at the time than it does today. It is wrong because our, our understanding and definition of sovereignty today um, 
implies that when we use that word, we think in those same terms when we, when we put place it somewhere in history in the past, but it's not, you know, and so this is, this is the point that we make very much here, is that sovereignty, if we should even use that term historically in, in Asia, um, is something that was not um, exclusive, not necessarily territorial, was shared, in other words, you could have different rulers that shared sovereignty at different levels. Uh, the fact that he might have been considered sovereign because he was the, the highest political authority in Asia didn't mean that he had authority to rule Tibet. He didn't rule Tibet. Uh, that was the Dalai Lama's uh, and, and the Tibetan government's uh, thing. But in other words, today, you, you're either sovereign or you're not. You either have... a, a um, sovereignty is exclusive to a particular territory. You can't have two or three sovereigns over a territory. At that time, you had different arrangements, great tolerance, and many different interpretations depending on the legal, international legal system that you belonged to. So the, the whole Tibetan Buddhist world had one particular um, system of relations and of rule and legitimacy. The Sinic world had its own. The Mongol Jinkishid world had its own. And all of these tolerated that you could have relations that each interpreted according to their worldview, according to their legal system. Uh, we're not accustomed to that anymore today either. We have one way of, of describing it and interpreting it, and that's why we have very major conflicts about it because we all have to agree on the same exclusive type of interpretation. I'm sorry, this is maybe a little unclear, and, um, but I hope it gives you some, uh, some satisfaction for that question. 17-point agreement is very important, and I think completely misunderstood uh, by many uh, on, on a number of levels. So, 17-point agreement was forced onto Tibet. I think there's little argument about that. I think everybody agrees on that. But why and how it was forced on Tibet, I think there's different emphasis that is put. Mostly people focus on the fact that the negotiators that were sent to Beijing by the Tibetan government, by the Dalai Lama, were put under pressure to sign the agreement that their seals were forged, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That is important, but that's not that's not crucial. Um, what is essential is that the treaty was imposed on Tibet by the use of force by one state over another. In other words, China got Tibet to sign that agreement after it had invaded Tibet and defeated the Tibetan army. That makes the agreement invalid in international law regardless of whether the envoys were put under stress or not put under stress. It makes it irrelevant that the Dalai Lama sent a telegram afterwards under pressure that he agreed to the 17-point agreement. It makes it irrelevant that the Tibetans tried to abide by the agreement. And I think this is not understood the agreement could never get any validity under international law because its inception was invalid. Um, and yes, there is a technique in international law that requires that you establish the invalidity by denouncing the agreement at some point, which of course the Dalai Lama did as soon as he could in freedom in 1959. Before that, he was not in, in a position to accept or deny it uh, uh, of a free will. So that agreement simply has no validity, period. Um, and so also that is not, cannot be a ground for saying that Tibet became a part of China because of the agreement, which is also something that uh, some scholars have suggested. Um, that even though it might not have been a part of China before, the agreement turned it into a part of China. So that is also not the case, not legally. Of course, I'm not disputing the fact that Tibet came under Chinese control, under Chinese rule in 1951. That happened. 
And that, incidentally, is the date of the, of the, of the, um, of the attempted or illegal annexation of Tibet. It is not 1959. Uh, I, I've seen in, in a number of places, even NGOs, that refer to Tibet having been invaded by China 60 years ago. It's 70 years ago, it's not 60 years ago. 59 was simply uh, an abrogation of even China's imposed agreement, 1951 agreement, for real autonomy in Tibet. And at that moment, China said, forget it. It was like the you know, 1956 invasion of, of, uh, of Hungary. It was, uh, but except that Hungary and Czechoslovakia later in 68, were, they were not uh, part of the Soviet Union. But in other words, it, it uh, anyway. And the, 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 the first question about the Yuan, uh, the, the, the comparison, yes, the, many comparisons like that can be made. Um, uh, you know, even more dramatic perhaps is, um, is England a part of India? Or is New Zealand a part of India? Or is the, are the United States a part of India? Um, or Burma? I mean, India was the jewel in the crown of the British Empire. China was the jewel in the crown of the Manchu Empire. China was the jewel in the crown of the Eastern Mongol Empire, clearly. Does that make everything else that was part of that empire part of China suddenly? Or, in other words, all these other places part of India because it was the most important part of the British Empire? No, it doesn't, doesn't make sense. Doesn't hold water. Thank you. Michael, uh, Sonam Frazi, representative of His Holiness Dalai Lama in London office. Michael, I wanted to ask you a question which you said uh, France cannot give legitimacy to China. By inference, do all the countries who recognize Tibet as part of People's Republic of China give a legitimacy to China? And if that is not possible uh, for you in your example that France cannot give legitimacy, is there a process available legally to contest the British government's change in policy of 2008? Uh, recognizing Tibet as part of People's Republic of China. Yeah, so, legally speaking, <coughs> France, Britain, other countries cannot legitimize an illegal occupation of another country, an illegal annexation of another country. It, it's simply not possible. Um, politically speaking, and recognition is a political act, it's not a legal act, it's a political act. Uh, politically speaking, it has a big impact because it creates a sense of legitimacy or it creates for China a sense that they don't need to fear that anybody is going to contest their rule of Tibet. So it has an importance, it has an impact. Um, and, and, and that is why it shouldn't be done. That is why these countries, besides the fact that it's illegal for them to recognize that Tibet's part of China, there is also a practical reason why they shouldn't do it. One is because it does create a false sense of legitimacy for China and therefore also uh, the opposite for Tibetans. It kind of delegitimizes Tibetans or their, their cause. Um, but what I've been pointing out to some governments is also this. Most of our governments have a policy which is and, it, and a stated policy, which is to support a negotiated solution to the Sino-Tibetan conflict. Acting the way they do, by making statements that Tibet's part of China, as the French did, as the British did, as the Danish did, as the US has done, um, is undermining their own policy. Because the only reason the Chinese leaders have to go to the Tibetans or to accept to negotiate with the Tibetans and talk to them is so that they get the legitimacy from the Tibetans for their rule of Tibet in exchange for, hopefully, a robust, guaranteed, uh, satisfactory autonomy arrangement. 
if, um, if the members of the international community make these statements or act in ways that imply that they consider Tibet to be a part of China, they're taking away any incentive for the Chinese to negotiate with the Tibetans. There's no more need for the Chinese to negotiate for the, with the Tibetans from the Chinese point of view because they don't care that much about the legal side of things. They care about the impression and the political side of things. So it's self-defeating for governments to, take this, to make these statements. It is entirely unnecessary to make these statements. It's just that they want to court favor with China or they feel pressured because of uh, having met with his holiness or something else that puts them under pressure of China. But you know, there is no, I don't know of other situations, and you may know, where countries have to repeat again and again that they consider some territory to be part of some other country, um, like a mantra. Um, I don't know of other situation where, where countries actually do that. And so I, it is unnecessary. It, it, and, and so as a minimum, countries should stop doing it. Britain should stop doing it. Uh, better still, they should reverse their position. They should accept that Tibet's an occupied country, etc. Now, you've, you may have heard or you may have read that in the United States, um, there is quite important development in the past uh, year and months regarding language that Congress has legislated. And most recently, uh, um, language in the report of the Appropriations Act that states very clearly that, n that uh, no money should be uh, given to or used for uh, and I don't know the exact wording, I'm sorry, because it's a fairly recent thing and I don't have it memorized, but that no money should be used for a purpose or for an organization that implies or states that Tibet is a part of China until such time as the Secretary of State of the United States certifies to Congress that a um, mutually acceptable agreement has been negotiated and reached between the Tibetans and uh, and the PRC, something on those lines, something to that effect. This is exactly the kind of language we would like others to adopt as well, this, the kind of philosophy others should adopt as well. In other words, we're not going to, to accept Tibet as part of China until an agreement has been reached that satisfies the Tibetans. That's an incentive for the Chinese to negotiate. And that's how the international community can help promote negotiations or promote a solution to the Tibetan uh, uh, conflict with China. Okay, Dr. Tesla. Okay. One quick question. I'm Tenzin Tessel, uh, Tibet Policy Institute, Dharamsala, India. Um, within the um, academic circle, in, in, in Sinology, there are big ideas that actually runs that flies in the face of PRC's narrative on history. So you can think about New Qing history, critical Han studies. My question is, are these ideas um, uh, valuable to be communicated to general public? If yes, then how? No, absolutely. Uh, you're quite right. I mean, there is, there is this, this um, again, this direction, new Qing history, etc., is not new at all. It is new in Europe and in the United States, or particularly in the United States, but also in Europe. In Germany, there has been more of this thinking already for a longer time. Um, but again, as I, as I mentioned earlier, in Japan and in many other places, this is knowledge that has been there for a very, very long time already. Um, but yes, it needs to be it needs to be dissipated. It, the general public needs to understand that, they're under, that, they're, uh, that the narrative that they have adopted is uh, a self-serving Chinese narrative. Now, I'm not suggesting that Chinese historiography, serious Chinese historiography, um, is false. It is a particular way of looking at history, the same way as you know, colonial power writes its history um, 
to glorify its own deeds, right? Okay, think of it in the same way. Uh, most countries do that. Most countries have a national narrative that glorifies themselves and puts the others down. Uh, fine, we know that. But then don't give that absolute importance. It needs to be balanced with other narratives that are equally valid. And so we just need to understand that this cynic view of the world is one view, and it's a view that supported a particular political objective throughout. And, but what is very interesting from, uh, uh, on your point is two things. One, China has been the, the government, the PRC and the Communist Party has been attacking scholars that have been promoting what is called New Qing history, in other words, this broader view of, of history, very aggressively and denying them visas and all kinds of stuff, simply for their, their uh, openness of mind, if you like. And, um, and the second interesting thing is that um, uh, chi Chinese scholars, including one who has written specifically a book on Tibet, which uh, has, uh, has the title, I think, Tibet has never been a part of China, the same title as the book that is going to be um, presented in, in uh, German and, and, Italian. and Italian today. Uh, by the way, none of these projects are, are related. Strangely enough, they're all coming out very much at the same time with the same conclusion uh, from different approaches. But the one from the Chinese scholar, uh, Hon Xiang Lao, is based entirely and only on Chinese historiography and on Chinese uh, so original source material, uh, Chinese uh, dy dynastic histories and uh, geographies in the Chinese language, without taking into account all the other things that I've talked about, the Mongol sources, the Manchu sources, anything like that, only Chinese. So it's a very traditional approach he comes to the same conclusion that Tibet was never a part of China. So even the dynastic histories themselves that glorify China and not just the empire, but China, um, never portray Tibet as part of China. So it's interesting that everybody actually is coming to the same conclusion despite the, the, the various approaches. And so that only emphasizes that the PRC's historical narrative, which is, by the way, not just their invention. The nationalist government that preceded them, the Kuomintang, started this narrative about the greater China uh, that included everything the previous empires uh, had acquired, whether they were Mongol empires or Yuan empires. They appropriated all the empires. Um, so that started in the Kuomintang, but the PRC has, has expanded that notion and has projected today's PRC state, and in fact a little bit larger. It includes, in some cases, Mongolia, it includes parts of India, it includes obviously the South China Sea. Today's PRC into the past as if that has existed for thousands of years as one state, a Chinese state. And that is complete falsification of history. We started late by 10 minutes, so maybe we can accommodate one more question of comment from audience. Yes, at Senate. Thank you so much. Um, <coughs> I, I'm André Gatonin, I'm a French senator and also a vice chair of the IPAC, the Interparliamentary Alliance on China. So, dear Michael, I, I listen to you, and uh, I'm also um, an academic on uh, history. And on a historical point of view, I totally agree with you. But on a political and legal uh, point of view, it seems very different. When we look at the recent situation of Hong Kong, China broke two times international treaty. First, the agreement, the Sino-British agreement of 84, that gave to uh, Hong Kong a specific status, political called status, to mm -hmm. uh, till uh, 2047. They broke this, and they also broke another treaty, a very important treaty, a convention, the Convention of Vienna from 1969 that China has ratified, signed and ratified, which explained that if there is no uh, juridical reserve in 
the text, the, the, the deal agreement, you cannot change that. They've changed their mind because they passed, they obliged to pass this uh, National Security Act and also uh, Electoral Security uh, Act, and they broke that. And nobody at an international level at this time reacted. So I think it's a little bit difficult to turn back to the past about the, what was really the kind of autonomy that uh, China had. And the other fact, I agree to say, okay, um, Tibet is not part of China. But um, we have to be careful because the, the, the middle way promoted by His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, is to say, okay, you have so more or less federal uh, constitution of China. So we ask inside this, uh, uh, this uh, constitution, Chinese communist constitution, um, uh, recognizing more or less autonomy to uh, Tibet region, where we have to define what is the Tibet territory, and we ask to uh, promote some kind of real autonomy re uh, relying on this agreement. Is it not a kind of contradiction uh, with the, 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 the purpose uh, you have now? Could you explain me, please? Uh, yes, the, the, um, let me again start with the second one first, yeah. and, then the, and then the second the first one. Second question, I think, is, is critical. And uh, you're not the first to ask it, because it... it uh, so, there is a big difference between saying that, or accepting, or implying that today Tibet is part of China, and then saying now you should negotiate on some special arrangement, and saying, as His Holiness has in the Strasbourg proposal, as His Holiness has in the Five Foot Peace Plan, very clearly, Tibet was and is independent. But we are willing to accept to become part of the PRC or to have a, a position within the framework of the PRC and its constitution in exchange for a robust, guaranteed, satisfactory autonomy. In other words, we are willing to accept as part of a package, if you give us this, we'll give you that, period. But not say, today, Tibet is part of China, then there's nothing left to negotiate. There's nothing left to, to exchange in exchange for real autonomy. So I think this is the essential, the essential difference. And so there's no contradiction between insisting on on the fact that Tibet is not a part of China and should not be considered a part of China today. Um, in fact, the more that one considers it to be a part of China, the less likelihood that any negotiations leading to a positive result will take place. So I don't think there's any contradiction with that, but I think it needs to be explained because also in the media, obviously the press very often misquotes or, or um, uh, and. And frankly, His Holiness also often uses language very generally. And uh, I've had this discussion with him, and he says, you're the lawyer, you, you think of the terminology, I'm just saying what I'm thinking. So it's, but that can lead to misunderstandings. It can lead to the notion that His Holiness or the Tibetan government in exile, the CTA, um, already is accepting that Tibet is part of China, and that there is therefore just the question of trying to find within the PRC constitution some room for, for negotiation, some room for improvement. Um, and I don't think that's the case. If you see also the, um, uh, the memorandum on genuine autonomy that the uh, Central Tibetan Administration gave to um, the PRC to consider as this is what the kind of autonomy that we think would work, that we would like, um, that is a very robust autonomy. That is real autonomy. Um, administrative, political, territorial, um, that would enable Tibetans to 
maintain their, their national identity, their religion, their religious practice, their language, and everything else. But it hasn't been a request only to have cultural autonomy or uh, religious autonomy because that might fit in the, in the Constitution. But there is, there is also this notion that, you know, in, in, the constitution, in the present Constitution of China, there is room in Article 31 for any kind of special arrangement. So anything Tibetans negotiate need not be outside of the Constitution of the PRC because there is this provision that allows it, just as it was used for Hong Kong, and as China has said they would use it for Taiwan. Um, and within the rest of the Constitution, there are principles that are stated about autonomy and, and use of language and all these things um, that, that can be used to say, well, you, you have already these principles in your Constitution. Why can't we turn them into real things? Um, so that's the answer to, to that question, I think. I hope that it, it helps. The, your, your point about the treaties that China violates is completely true. China, China has a very different um, relationship to law and treaties. And um, we should not be surprised because if you read the, the, the Chinese communist um, a theory on, on and, and Mao's writings, etc., already from that time on law and treaties, it is an instrument of politics. We have this notion of rule of law. So law is above, and then the politics have to be in accordance with the rules. In China, international law and law is an instrument of politics. So the objective is a political objective and then law can be used or adapted or changed or violated in accordance with your political needs. So it fits completely in the Chinese uh, way of thinking today, Chinese communist thinking. So there's no contradiction as far as they're concerned. There's contradiction for us because we consider a law something that we really have to abide by. But that is not the case in, in China. And so that probably doesn't create so many problems within the Chinese mind in in China itself, since that is the system, but it does create it on the international plane because we're talking about, we're using the same terminology to mean very different things. Just a question, would you agree with me if uh, I say that uh, for uh, Chinese authority, uh, treaties or international convention are only tiger paper, <laughs> as in, as in uh, Mao Tse Tung, uh, yes. Yes, they are. they are. They are simply instruments for them to achieve their objectives. And as soon as that objective no longer requires that piece of paper, then you move on to the next thing. Thank you. We wish we have a little longer time to have and to continue this session, but unfortunately we have to stop here. We have a program to follow. So thank you very much, Dr. Michael, for all your works and legal expertise, and in particular, bringing this timely and indispensable reference for government, civil societies, and international community to, uh, to think again in reference to China and before buying the narrative of Beijing. Thank you so much. You. So may I request Honorable Sigyong Pempa Siringla to kindly present Katak and a token of memento to Dr. Michael. Thank you so much, Dr. Michael. And thank you to all audience for your engagement and contribution for making this session interesting. Thank you very much, Dr. Michael La and Gandalna. Um, before we break for tea, may I request Kungo Sikyong uh, to kindly release two books. Um, these are the German and Italian version of 
very, I mean, directly related uh, to what Dr. Michael has been speaking about, the book um, and a 2018 publication of the CTA titled Tibet was never a part of China, but the middle way approach remains a viable solution. So these are the German and Italian versions. <laughs> Thank you, Honorable Si Kyongla. So um, on behalf of Tibet Bureau Geneva, I would like to acknowledge the contributions of Tibet uh, Swiss Friendship Association, Plaza Boy Switzerland, Itali Italy Tibet Association, and ICT Germany for their contribution in making the translation and publication of these two versions possible. Thank you very much, and we now break. Let's break for tea for half an hour and we will reconvene at 11.15. Thank you very much.